So three years ago, I returned to graduate school after spending time as a public school teacher in Los Angeles. But while I was away, which granted was only five years, something momentous happened. Some of you are probably familiar with the folk tale of Rip Van Winkle. Now, Rip, like me, was a guy who liked disease. So much so, in fact, that he slept for 20 years. Now, I kind of felt like Rip. Only Rip, upon waking, found out that he had completely slept through the American Revolution. I felt like Rip, only I had slept through the big data and AI revolution. So just for some perspective on how recent this all is. A 2018 study done by IBM found that 90% of the world's data has been created in the last two years. So it was clear. We're making decisions with data more and more, and yet somehow scrutinizing those decisions less and less. For better or for worse, big data is changing the world that we live in, and yet somehow it wasn't quite changing public schools. So this is why I became a proponent for the democratization of big data. And before we get started, let's all agree on a definition of big data. So when I say big data, I refer to the uses of statistical modeling and computing to observe patterns in large data sets. Image recognition, speech recognition, Google Translate, targeted ads. You guys are familiar with these, right? They take up your whole Facebook feed. How could you not be? So essentially, they all start with a large data set. Think just like a huge Excel spreadsheet. What data science scientists do is they use models and algorithms to classify and predict phenomena within these data sets uh, in a way that uh, people once thought to be impossible. Now, my whole interest in this field most likely has to do with the fact that I was a high school mathematics teacher. And I became a teacher because I grew up as a military brat. So I, I've seen the whole spectrum of public schools. I had seen the good and the bad, but there was always one constant, and that was uh, dedicated teachers that impacted the lives of students in their classrooms. So I wanted to pay it for it. I wanted to be one of those teachers. So in 2011, I was in an Algebra II class, and this is at Locke High School in the Watts District of Los Angeles. And I had a student ask me the toughest math question I had ever been asked, and it had nothing to do with how to solve a problem. I had this student, Delvin, and Delvin was a super bright kid. And one day, he was just like, Walsh, why do we study logarithms? Not just for later math, but nobody in my neighborhood uses logarithms, and they're doing just fine. So I gave him some convoluted first-year teacher answer about science or jobs, or I, I kind of blacked it out. But I don't think either one of us was satisfied with that answer. I know I wasn't. So, over the next couple of years, it kind of consumed me. I was like, why, why do we teach logarithms? Was it because it was on a state standards list? Was it because my principal told me to? You know, were, were, were logarithms life or death? Or did they even materially affect the conditions of my students' lives? So two years later, and I was a grizzled veteran. I'd, I'd done a whole lot of living in that two years. I decided to take a different approach to that logs unit. So first thing I did, obviously, all the standard equation solving, evaluating, and what have you. But then I asked them to take out their phones. That was a big hit. I never let them do that. Um, and I said, take out your phones, find the payday loan storefront closest to your house. I want you to ask the clerk what the annual percentage interest rate is on a $200 loan principal. And so, for those of you that aren't familiar, payday loans are these poorly regulated, high-interest loans. They often lead to financial ruin in, in communities across America. So I sat there, and I listened as 30 students called 30 different loan places. And I would listen to them routinely mislead my students into thinking that the interest rate was 15%, the annual percentage rate, instead of 15% of the total principal after two weeks. So let's do some math here. You're not getting out that easy. It's 15% after two weeks. How much after four weeks? 30%. How much after six weeks? 45%. How much after eight weeks? 
60%, all the way up to, over a one-year period, a 390% annual percentage rate. And it's continuously compounding. So, then I had them do some math. I said, okay, guys, how long is this gonna take to double? How long is this gonna take to triple? So I watched them plug stuff in, get calculators, divide, but eventually they got to a point where they said, Mr. Walsh, how do we solve for the T for time? And I just tried to play it off all cool. I was like, oh man, you just use a <coughs> log both sides. <laughs> in my head, I'm like, yes, yes. <laughs> um, so then after that, I had them do some research. I said, so where are these payday loan stores actually located? And so what they found was, these payday loan stores are eight times as likely to be a majority black and brown communities as they are majority white communities. And I think most of you guys probably live in or around Austin. That should make this map make a lot more sense. So that came to be my conclusion, that you teach logarithms so that students can understand the financial mechanisms of oppression and how to resist them. Fast forward a couple of years, I'm, I'm back here. I'm at the School of Education here at UT. We got any School of Ed people in here? Whoop, whoop. Thank you. Yes, a couple, great. Uh, <laughs> so I'm back at the School of Education, and I'm here in Austin, but I kept thinking back to my students back in LA. As I learned more about this whole big data revolution, I started to think, just like with the logarithms, the algorithms were also mechanisms of oppression. So then, you know, I started to jog my mind, you know, if I were trying to teach this. And in the math teaching game, we have this thing called uh, motivating examples, right? They're examples that are real world problems that kind of motivate learning, right? So I begin to think, what does that look like with algorithms? And I came up with a few. The first one being, this is a predictive policing model. This tells police where to patrol, okay? This is used by Palantir and Los Angeles Police Department. And this tells police where to patrol and it contributes to the over-policing in communities of color. I thought about network theory-based surveillance models. Now these models surveil friends and families of suspected criminals, whether or not anybody has committed a crime. Thought about credit scoring models that has served as a sort of de facto new mechanism of redlining. And last, I thought about pretrial risk assessment models like Compass. And ProPublica did a, a wonderful, wonderful piece on this. So what these models do is they predict the probability that somebody is going to reoffend or go back to prison. Um, and they differentially affect black citizens seeking parole. And these are used in counties all across the country. So I thought about all these things. Now, I don't think it's entirely obvious how all this happens. How can a purely mathematical model encapsulate bias, okay? So, imagine this. Get. I don't know about you, anytime I opened the data set, it did the same thing. It was just, <laughs> boom. I was like, wow, that's powerful. Okay. All right, so. <laughs> Back to it, because this actually is not funny at all. So, it's not. All right, so, you have a, a training data set, and this is a real world data set. Now, each row represents a person. It's a whole bunch of demographic information, but the important part is over there. You have a binary outcome. Zero means that they actually did reoffend or did not reoffend. One means they reoffended and got sent back to prison. So this is real data. So we put this gigantic spreadsheet, zoom, 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 do a little math and magic. We're at it. We come to our risk score model. Okay. So far, so good. Excellent. Okay. So now we have this risk score model, and we're going to make up two vectors, Dave and Max. We, we are only going to change one thing about Dave and Max and that's their race, okay? So far, so good. Now here's what happens. It spits out two entirely different probabilities of reoffending. But why does it do this? Well, 
No one can really be sure, but it probably has to do with one, overrepresentation of African Americans in the training data set, and two, differential policing. Okay? Now, when I say differential policing, uh, I refer, uh, I'll give you an example. So, one of the most common ways that people um, have parole violations is incidental police contact. Okay? And a lot of incidental police contact comes from traffic stops. Now, a 2015 study by the Stanford Computational Journalism Lab found that black motorists were twice as likely as white motorists to be searched when they are pulled over. Twice as likely, okay? So, all of the, these things work in concert to create a sort of feedback loop, okay? So, you have African Americans that receive differential risk scores. As a result, they receive higher levels of supervision and longer parole sentences. Once released, they experience differential policing, and as a result, go back into the training data set. And the cycle continues and continues and continues. It's depressing, right? If we want to change this, we need to change who is taught how to use these tools and how they're taught to use them. This is why I'm a proponent for the democratization of big data and the need for algorithmic ethics and accountability to be taught in public schools. So, a lot of things need to change. If we are ever to see a, data, a field of data professionals that reflects the diversity of America, we need to take the momentum back as public institutions. Now, you've probably seen, and I don't want to call them by name because there are lots of great people working at them, these data science boot camps where adults and children can learn anything they want to learn about data. I believe that they should be getting that in K-12 public schools and public institutions because any time you create a barrier like cost, you run the risk of excluding from the field groups that have experienced generational poverty in America. Okay? So now that I've outlined the why, let's get to the how. First probability. We need to change the way that we teach K-12 students probability. As you can see, it's being taught, but it's this problem of a mile wide and an inch deep. Now, if I were to run this by any college probability professor, they would go, wow, that's it. There's no random variables, there's no distributions. I see no compelling reason why anyone should have to take three courses of college calculus before they understand what a random variable is and what a distribution does, okay? Especially considering there's research at Vanderbilt where they've been successful at having students as early as the fifth grade create sampling distributions and make inferences off them. Now, these numbers actually represent the height of trees grown under differential amounts of light. It's pretty amazing. Second thing that needs to change, how we teach computational thinking. Now, CS Unplugged is a good example of a pedagogy that teaches the fundamentals of computational thinking. Now, this young lady right here is being tasked with finding the heaviest of a bunch of different film canisters using only a scale and a set number of moves. So she's trying to minimize the number of moves, right? Do you guys notice what's missing? Anybody? Computer. The answer isn't just to shove a computer in front of kids earlier and earlier. They need to understand that the things that the algorithms are doing are tied to a concrete phenomena before they can deal with the, the abstraction of a programming language. Third thing that needs to change, um, warning, for those of you that have taken AP statistics, this is gonna hurt. Okay, so at current, stats is taught in high school. It's taught in AP statistics. Not all students take it, some do. Now, the reason why it could have hurt for some people is because by the end of this, you actually like become one with a Z-score lookup table, okay? <laughs> And then some of you guys get to college and you realize stats isn't really about this table, right? So it doesn't involve computing, a programming language, or a paradigm that's driving much of the innovation in machine learning right now, Bayesian inference, okay? Now, there is a great example of a class that does a lot of these things, and it is UCLA's Introduction to Data Science course. This course is taught in one-fifth of Los Angeles high schools. For those of you that aren't familiar with LAUSD, it's an incredibly linguistically, ethnically, economically diverse school district. If you can do it in LA, you can do it 
anywhere. And I do believe that this, that introduction to data science or some variant should be taught at every, every high school in the country. So in addition to many of the same standards you'd see in uh, AP statistics, it also includes programming in the R language and then in-demand data skills like web scraping and regression. So key throughout all of this is an attention to ethics and accountability of algorithms. Now, the College Board has a new class. It's pretty cool. It's called AP Computer Science Principles, and it really gives a lot of room to deal with these ethical issues. But I don't think that's going farther enough, far enough. I envision a broader strategy. I think that every high school civics classroom should involve issues of eth ethics and accountability. Right, it's profound, I know, thunder, right? <laughs> the reason I think that is because Big data and automation are continuing with or without us. And we need to prepare students for the societal and technological changes that come with that. OK, so that's the school stuff. Now, old teaching habits die hard. So I'm going to give you guys an exit slip. Number one, what can I do? You can call your local school board and tell them you want to see computational thinking and an introduction to data science or some variant in your schools. If you are a data professional, please, 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 Call a Title I school. Tell them that you would like to sponsor a team in the high school mathematical competition and modeling. I still can't say that all at once. Number two, we have a bunch of excellent uh, organizations that support both algorithmic accountability and diversity in AI. And I want to give a special shout out to uh, the bottom one. That's uh, the Vector90 co-working space. So for those of you that aren't familiar, it's in the Crenshaw District of Los Angeles, South LA. And it's a space where the community can get STEM programming and interact with the community. And I bring it up especially because the founder, community activist, and rapper Nipsey Hussle was gunned down last week in LA. And, but as Nipsey would say, the marathon continues, right? So it's my hope that co-working spaces will sprout up in inner cities all across America based on this example. Now. My generation was the first generation to have cell phones, large as they were, internet, desktop computers. Older generations called us digital natives. My vision for the future is that this current generation will be the first data natives, whose fluency and understanding, understanding of these concepts will outstrip us all. Now, if we teach them correctly, they'll make this world a better and fairer place. Thank you.